Hey now, it's Dan Eberhardt here and welcome to the Growing the Future podcast where we talk to folks who like to innovate, collaborate and transform the agricultural industry. Thanks so much for joining us for season six. Episode one is exciting to kick off the new year with a good friend of mine from Brandon, Manitoba, a fellow entrepreneur who's been recognized here uh, as being one of the top dogs as far as uh, building businesses and supporting community and, and really being an inspiration. His story is a true inspiration. You're going to want to stick around for it. But before I introduce today's esteemed guest, I'd like to remind you to check out the Aberhart family of companies online, starting with aberhartfarms.com, where we grow food to feed the world in Langenberg, Saskatchewan, suregrowth.ca, where we offer precision, agronomy, consulting services, convergencegrowth.com, where we accelerate solutions across food, health, and agriculture, and aberhartagsolutions.ca, where we deliver one-of-a-kind fertility solutions of the future to your farm. You can get notified about our new episodes by signing up for our newsletter at growingthefuturepodcast.ca. My next guest grew up on a family farm in the mountains of Germany. Epic. He pursued an education in agricultural engineering and agronomy in a program that combined classroom theory with the American equivalent of a series of internships. This man has some dirt under his fingernails, folks. Mm-hmm. This led him to spend a couple summers in Russia, another fall in Canada, and three weeks in Brazil working on farms while also completing his university work. After he earned his degree, he settled in Canada with nothing but a bag of clothes and some hope and uh, some internal motivation to take over the world, I'm sure. Today, he is the founder and CEO of Bushel Plus. We're going to talk about that. I really want to dig into this individual's entrepreneurial journey, uh, what he's gone through, the things that he's seen. We want to talk about his company and the growth that he's experienced and his team, which I know he's very passionate about, and some of the giving back that they do as an organization, which I know is very important to to him. And we also want to talk about what the future might hold for his uh, company or family of companies, all the different things they're working on. Welcome to the show, Marcel Kringer. 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 <laughs> There you go. Hey, welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Th- thanks for that. <laughs> well, how is that on a scale of one me. to ten? How, well, how is that on a scale of one to ten? That's good, Dan. The more we hang out, the better your German is getting. I tell you that. I want to. I want to roll my R's like a pro, but uh, I didn't grow up in the mountains of Germany, so I'm I'm selectively disadvantaged in that regard. Well, that would that would definitely help. That'd be a benefit to do that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How clean is the air in the mountains of Germany, my friend? That sounds so idyllic. I mean, I just imagine, uh, you know, a little house on the side of a mountain there with all kinds of farm animals and uh, fresh cream every day and fresh eggs and everybody just, you know, fresh beer. And what what, what was that like? Is it is it was it idyllic as it sounds? Or paint me a picture here. You uh, you know, they, you painted that picture very well there. Even though it sounds very uh, idyllic there, but no, you know, it's uh, it it was hard work. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it was amazing growing up uh, that way. Uh, I think you have to leave and come back to appreciate it more, because you know, once I I moved away in different areas and worked in different areas and then brought friends from those areas back to home, they went, they looked around. And went, like, why, why did you ever leave? Like, this is like going on vacation. Here. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, that's, you know, you can flip a tractor anytime, you know, you drive down some of those, some of those uh, fields and flip a tractor or um, no, very, very different than Manitoba, but pretty cool. You know, we grew up with four generations in on one farm, you know, great grandparents, grandparents, uh, blind brother from my grandpa, my parents and my sister and I all in one big farmhouse. Or well, a small farmhouse, depending how you look at it. So, yeah. The same small house. Farm. The, the, the same house. Yeah, the same house. It's like two, two levels, I guess, two levels. And like a, in here, you would call the walkout basement. And then there would be another building would be the barn and the shed and everything. Yeah. That's quite, a, busy. that's quite a legacy, quite an inheritance, quite a background. What do you think... Uh... What do you think you really inherited, though? I, I can tell, like your German precision engineering was kicking in, even as we went into this podcast. The way that you're straightening the logo and your attention to detail and your perfectionism, if you will, I think that's a cultural, cultural thing you inherit as a German, is it not? Yeah, the, you know, I worked in lots of different countries in the world, and it's very interesting how different cultures are, or where you grow up, how that shapes you. And I think my sign is still not 100% straight here. So. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> this is just, you know, this, this, this perfectionism that we joke about can be really good, can drive you, but you also have to be careful that it's not, you know, being destructive on the other side to yourself or how you build, how, how you build things. So, um, but yeah, Germany is definitely, um, it, I shouldn't say different, but it is definitely a different culture. And, you know, you, there is sayings now that I'm, you know, work in different areas, there's sayings that you remember that you grew up with and you go like, I don't think those sayings are really that, that good for long term. You know, like there's a saying in Germany, uh, you know how you, in English, the saying is you pat yourself on the back and you mm -hmm. should do that sometimes. You know what? And there's a German saying that says, uh, patting yourself on the back stinks. Like it smells like sh crap. Like it stinks. Interesting. There's a German, yeah. like you can't translate it in English like this. But yeah. there is sayings like that that are very much a little bit different. You know, if you're not first, you're last. Yeah, you know, there is there is a lot of these things. You know, my teacher in uh in egg school always said the day has 24 hours and a night. So keep <laughs> keep working. So you know, hard work, dedication is definitely something I guess I, I grew up with. Not a negative way. My family is awesome, absolutely amazing. I'm far away from them, but I love them. We're very close. Um, but you know, there is 80 you know, 85, 86 million people in Germany, and you can put Germany at least three to four times into Manitoba. So if into you're not Manitoba. doing it, wow. Oh yeah. Into Manitoba. That's wild. So if you're not doing it, there is a lot of other people that do it. You know, the, there is competition out there. So, um, so you gotta, gotta, gotta give her a bit. So, and, and culture entrepreneurship is, is different there too. It's very much about are uh, you sure you want to do that? I, uh, yeah, uh, maybe not. And uh, I, like, I talked to some other engineers in North America and, and they made this, they, they said they worked with engineers in Europe for years. And the, th the, the thing that they said, and this is not from me, okay? So that's what was, they were saying. They said, <laughs> in Germany, the engineers, they are uh, developing, 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 and then bringing it to market when it's like a thousand percent perfect. Where, where sometimes in other countries, it's like, okay, let's develop it and make sure we test it and get it out there and then fix it along the way. And, and neither is like a complete negative. Please don't take it that way. I'm not knocking anybody. Uh, it, it's just a different way of thinking about going to market and inventing some stuff. It's, it's interesting. That's a fascinating statement in the context of the whole geopolitical landscape. And I don't know how much you follow everything or who you're in touch with back home, but that whole manufacturing sector in, in Germany has really been challenged by energy concerns and uh, whether to heat the home or run the factories or make fertilizer with uh, Russians shutting off the tap. Have you been uh, exposed or privy to any of that or are, are folks back home feeling the pain? Yeah, certainly. It, there is a lot of change going on in Europe right now. And, you know, I've, I've been in touch with a lot of people or stay in touch with them because I, I worked in Germany, Eastern Europe. You mentioned my time in, in, in Russia as well um before all of these things happened here um so there is a lot of um hardship around the costs the inflation uh the energy but then also finding the right kind of people you know like you you put some there are some things that are coming into place that makes it hard to be a farmer and hard to be a manufacturer and it's it, it really comes back to okay like what actually makes sense like let's look at and talk to the people that that know some of the stuff in the industry and then come up with a con concept that that should be the the great thing about a democracy where you get different you get different ideas from from people but we should talk to the people that actually know what's going on in the industry to make decisions and that that's a struggle um that's definitely a struggle and energy is tough over there and now i mean we, we've seen now a lot more bigger crisis in in the world happening again where that has an effect of europe because we have people from all aspects in all areas living all over Europe and Canada. So it's, it's a challenge. Why, why would you ever leave home? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I love home. Don't get me wrong. I miss it. I miss my, fa <laughs> I miss my family. I miss the food, man. The food. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> what was your favorite? Yeah. Cadoblin glaze? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> It, it was the cream and dough and potato and onion mix that my, my grandmother made, who was Volga German. Oh, Volga German. Okay. Uh, Maybe might that's be a, a different, different breed. I don't know. Well, it is Volga is very far east. But, but, but again, it may just be a different terminology, right? There's different 
a lot of different terminology. Like we speak high German and then there's low German. Yeah. Like those yeah. are just the words, how it's named in English, but it's basically like a, a dialect of some sort mixed with an accent. So where I grew up, you know, you go in one town and the next town over is a few kilometers away has different words, different dialect for the same That's thing. crazy. That's, and that's the low German accent. So when you, when you speak in Germany at a somewhere trade show or bar, you can pick out where they come from, even though they're only like 50 kilometers away. That's incredible. But why would you ever leave? Yeah, I mean, um, I, here's the thing. I grew up on a 10-acre farm, not, not big enough to make a living of. And I always wanted to be a farmer. I, that, that was my thing. You asked me as a little kid, what do you want to be? Farmer. And in my area, there is a lot of um, like uh, hobby farming or as, as a side business, basically. People work in the industry, but they have a farm at home from back in the day from the grandparents, great-grandparents. Lots of smaller farms, like 10, 15 cows, you know, they make hay. And it's just, it's almost like the landscaping gets handled by the farmer of the whole area. But then there's also some big dairy farmers out there. So it's a bit of a mix, okay, but mostly grass. Um, and um, I want to do an apprenticeship as a farmer, which you kind of touched on in my introduction. But in order to do that, I had to go to a school that's two hours away. And also in that area would be more grain farming, bigger, bigger area, cash crop area, basically. So I moved there when I was 16. So I finished high school with 16, which is normal in Germany. And then I moved away to do this apprenticeship. So I signed those apprenticeship papers when I was 14. Because in Germany, it's the other thing, like you're 14 years old and you're like, and people ask you like, oh, what do you want to do when high school is done? You know, like you got two, two years left. What do you want to do? So, and, and I always knew again what I wanted to do, but you got to get your butt in gear and figure out, okay, like, am I signing an apprenticeship contract to become insurance broker, hairdresser, painter, electrician, whatever it is, it's an apprenticeship. Um, so I signed those with 14 and I think everybody was kind of like, yeah, we'll see if he really moves away. But you know, 16 came around and I was like, <laughs> it was, it was August, first of August harvest was going on. I was like, I'm gone. They didn't think it's you were going to go. Well, it was, they thought I would, but it was just interesting. You know, when you're 14 years old and you, you tell your family, it is what I'm going to do. And they're like, yeah, yeah, two, two years sure, away. Sure. So let's, yeah. let, let, let's see. Cause, cause I always, if you look, if you ask my mom, if she thought I, I would ever live in a different country when I was 10 years old or eight years old, she is probably a no, because, you know, I was a pretty shy kid stuttering. You know, I had to go to a, like, you had to go to a, like a speak trainer here to get my stuttering out of the way. And really? today I don't, I don't shut up anymore. So maybe, they, <laughs> maybe I should not. But your English is speak. excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you. I have to keep up with you guys. You guys got a lot of slang around here. <laughs> so technically I, I just went away from, from home to pursue my dream in agriculture. And then you live with the farmer family. So I moved to this farmer family for this apprenticeship. So you live with that family in the same house, you know, you're part of the family. So, and, um, that that's part of that. And how different was that uh, than where you grew up? Very flat. It's it's like moving from the it's like moving from the the mountains or the hills, let's say, into like you know the Red River Valley. Very flat. You know, larger fields, larger farms. But but in comparison, you know, those farms were two hundred fifty to eight hundred acres with lots of livestock. Uh, but it was professional. You know, like it was like okay. Like I remember my boss asking me, like, have you plowed the field? Like, have you worked with the plow before? I said, oh yeah, I, I've plowed the field before. It's like, what, what kind of equipment? I said, well, a 35 horsepower tractor with a one furrow <laughs> plow. And he looks at me, he's like, that's, that's not a plow. <laughs> that's a garden. So he, yeah. He's like, well, here's the 150, 180 horsepower tractor and a four or five furrow plow. And now we'll figure this out here. And, you know, like, it's just, <laughs> it's just very different, right? He must've been in heaven as a farm boy. Oh, it was great. Yeah. I, I loved that. That was some of the, that was a really good time. It was a, it was a, you know, tough to be away and with a different family. Cause if you're not used to that, like you had to grow up rather fast and you know, uh, you learn how to respect other people, how to get into certain situations, I guess. Cause all of a sudden you're like from one day to the other, you're, you're in a different family. Now you're part of it. There, there you go. And you do that three times. The apprenticeship is three years and every year you go on a different farm. That's fantastic. And I've, and I've been friends with them ever since, you know, they're, they're like my second family still until today. 
and yeah. it's been uh it's been an an interesting journey let's put it that way yeah. how different were those three farms so the first one was a uh, sow's furl to finish so pigs and and grain um, we're talking like 200 acres in grain and then the second one was dairy and a mix uh and a mix of cash crop and and grassland and then the third one is dairy and then um same grain and grass mixed with um um, kind of like a feedlot, basically finishing, finishing bolts and steers. Okay. Wait a minute. You went to three so. different, relatively modern, large German farms, and you never met a nice German girl, farmer's daughter and settled down Marcel. <laughs> what, what, what? Yeah, I know. It's just like, <laughs> apparently it hasn't happened in Canada either yet. So, you know, it's a uh, brand is the saying... most eligible bachelor besides me. <laughs> yeah, I think you're way ahead of me, sir. <laughs> it's uh oh, you know, it, it wasn't not that it not at the uh, not that it wasn't uh you know you met a lot of people along the way, but it's just <laughs> do tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next time. Wait for part two. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you that's crazy though. I that's that's incredible experience to because it must have been different management systems, or were they all just sort of the uptight perfectionist uh rather humble uh germans <laughs> very very different <laughs> you know like it's been yeah very different styles you know whereas one farm was very much you like you would you would address the boss with sir and his last <laughs> name oh yeah that was the first farm right oh so, really and his, yeah and his wife as well i miss Oh, uh, I always mess that up in English. Is it Miss or Mrs. when you're married? What It'd is it? be Miss? Mrs. Yeah, M -R -S. Mrs. Yeah. So, yeah. so Mrs. Da, 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 and Mr. <laughs> da, 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 da. Wow. So and the very next formal. farm, oh, yeah, very formal. The next farm more open, you know, not as old school, but everything was very hard work. And, and you know, you you don't get paid a whole lot. That's the funny part. You know, my my buddies went into the industry and and you know and electronics and whatnot, and they were they were a pretty good buck. But as a farmer, they take room and board off your paycheck. Uh, and you don't make a whole lot in the beginning payroll in the first place. So then the first pay stub in the first year is 69 something, 68 something euros per month, which is if you, if you, if you tr like 110 Canadian, <laughs> 110 oh, Canadian. Geez. And you're Doesn't like, go very far is... in Amazon or at the bar. Right. You're like, Okay. Wow. Great. Well, but on the other hand, you're saving a lot of money because you're always working. It's like, yeah. <laughs> um, and then it kind of, it kind of staggers to a couple hundred more. And then the good bosses usually up this a bit, you know, if you do good work, but it's, uh, that's kind of the standard. So a lot of people don't realize that where you have to give up a lot from day one to, in order to go after your dream, um, and, and do that. And, you know, and then I, again, I have very thankful for my parents that, you know, me through some of this stuff where um where um that really helped me along the lines here to also then like uh, besides university i always worked like university school doesn't matter i always worked on on farms or for custom harvesters to pay for school it's because because you have to because you make 110 bucks in the apprenticeship <laughs> a month which is ridiculous you broke. <laughs> yeah After three years of internship. <laughs> so but loved it you know lots of lots of work and you know um, worked for some, not in the apprenticeship world, but you know, in some other areas, uh, worked for some some interesting people where you learn the good stuff and the stuff that you don't want to do yourself in the future. So yeah, how are those businesses doing now? Have they changed a lot? Do they have you know lots of challenges and opportunities right now in 2023? I suppose that's a good question. They changed a lot. Actually, the pig farm went um, completely away from the sows and uh, the piglets. And they just have a small finishing bar now, and he's actually working full time now. Um, so he changed his whole business model of no more farming entrepreneurship because it the prices, the the growth, it 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 wasn't feasible for him. And he's back to a full time job basically and doing the finishing barn on the side and some of the the cash crop farming, which which really, you know, is 
yeah, hurts my hurts my feelings there. My I don't know how <laughs> what what's the right thing to say there is like it yeah it uh, you know because it's 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 near and dear to my heart and you know again we're good friends but that was his life decision that's good it's the right thing for him he said they're finishing some some pigs like on straw and then sell it locally um, and the dairy farm has been and the the feedlot have been growing ever since but the next generation they also implemented um, more local stuff so they started having chickens and selling meat locally. So they have like a, a shop on the farm where they sell local product pro, uh, products and milk. They have like a milk, um, uh, what is it called? Like an, I have the German word in my mind here, but basically you have like, you know, those uh, way where you get a Coke bottle out of it. Or what's it called? Yeah, Drink machine. A drink machine. Yeah, basically a milk drink machine they put up, but oh, they really? fill with their own milk at, it 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 fix it all up and then people can come there with their glass bottles and and buy it from there. So they they're looking at different ways to market as well. It'd be tough because it probably the central theme is it, it's hard to expand with such limited land. So you got to diversify or work off the farm. Yeah, and land is expensive, right? So I mean, it's, what would be it's, the it's, Canadian it's... equivalent? What would be the Canadian equivalent? Do you think of land per the? I guess it's hectares and all that. So. Yeah, so I, sorry, you. I didn't prepare for that, Dan. <laughs> well, I wanted you to research before you know, came to I'm the sorry. show. I mean, man, you're letting the audience I'm down just, here, man. They're I'm hanging sorry. on I, your I every word here. Didn't do We're waiting for like properly. some seventy-five thousand dollars Canadian per acre or something. Shock and awe here. There is some shocking prices. So you know, there is some shocking prices in Canada already, uh, especially you know way further east in Ontario and whatnot in the livestock areas. But it's even higher than over there. Absolutely. Like it's it's you're talking a, f a few tens of thousands of dollars per acre, uh, and and it really depends where. So you, you got to bear with me here, right? There is some areas where yeah. it's like a sandbox, and there are some areas where people grow 160, 170 bushel barley or wheat you know, right by the ocean. So it's very different. Um, and then you have a lot of building areas where people want to build houses on, but it's, it's very competitive and it's, um, it's intense farming too, you know, like winter wheat grows there, for, like, you know, almost nine, 10 months of the year. Same with winter canola, very different growing conditions. Well, you could That's look over intense. there too, and look at some of what might be coming here uh, for regulation and, you know, consumer sentiment and, and politics. I mean, this is a big deal over there, especially in places like the Netherlands where, you know, Christian Hebert this week, I seen him present and he was talking a lot about the license to farm as being one of the biggest risks that he's, he's facing. You know, I haven't seen anything from Christian Hebert, what he said around that, that, so I don't want to say the wrong thing for, for that topic, but what I know from Europe and here, I remember years ago when I was a curricular agronomist, we got invited to Winnipeg to uh, like kind of like a media training session. And, and, and I wish I could give credit to the people that put it on. Um, but I don't remember who put that on. And it was Manitoba egg in the classroom, I think was there as well. And a bunch of industry people. And the whole training was about how do we speak to people outside of the industry about our industry? How do we talk about agriculture? Right. And, and some people weren't too concerned about it. It's like, oh, yeah, we just explain them what we do. And it's like, wow, but, you know, a lot of people don't have that understanding anymore. Why a combine is driving down the road and why we, the sprayer is going across the field. And I, I stood up and I said, hey, I was born and raised in Europe. And, you know, I've been, been facing this, this since I grew up because there's, again, a lot more cities, a lot more people. And, you know, I was in high school and one of my main teachers asked me if, being a farmer is actually a, a job if that is an apprenticeship and we were in a countryside area like again not many full-time <laughs> farmers it was lots of hobby farming yeah but i almost fell off my chair and she's yeah. teaching she's teaching in a high school on the countryside right. and she's teaching a like geography and a couple like like important top not biology but she was talking uh, teaching a couple of very important classes so it's like if, if they don't even know you know what they're doing there you know so so long story short, I, I told them like, here, this is what we're facing in Germany, where when we just talk about our own lingo and our own slang, yeah, sprayer puts this and this on and they drive over it, we're good. That doesn't work. We have to translate that into 
stories and why and the context. I'm a big fan of context. Doesn't matter if it's with our team or employees or customers setting expectations. It's the context is important. And if people don't understand that, it's tough. Specifically, we have we have stopped over the last 15, 20 years teaching people where food comes from. That's the issue. That's the problem. I, in, at least in my opinion, in my humble opinion, you know, if I'm allowed to say that, that that's what we didn't do in schools where my great grandparents and grandparents and whatnot, you know, like that, that was a different generation and they had, I mean, they also had to work at home and they, they were probably feeding some of themselves. Like, cause I was, sorry, comparing my grand, grand great grandparents to my generation is, is very, a lot of in between. But what I mean by this, the last 10, 20 years, we haven't taught our kids where food's coming from in the classroom. It was really not really there, at least where I grew up. And, and now then they grow up and, and hear different things. And now with social media blowing up and, and, you know, everybody can throw an opinion online. It's really tough to, to kind of turn it around and educate the right way again. And, and, you know, in, in an agriculture, there's a lot of different opinions too, what's right or what's wrong. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, you know, we always have to look at the context and, and, and look at both sides of the, of the picture. So it, it is a lot of things that are over there that are coming over here, not just in politics, but also in people, you know, people not supporting uh, eating meat anymore or, or other things. I was on an agricultural campus where people try to put through that no more meat is going to get sold. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like <laughs> half of your students are pig farmers. It's like, you know, like there is a disconnect and the disconnect is, Again, like we have to get people to talk. It's, it's too bad to see that we have people talking to each other and everybody doesn't want to move a little bit. It's like, I'm right, you're wrong. Well, we have to, in order to come to consensus, we have to figure out both sides, or I say sides, so, but I just say sides as an example. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's two or three or four people talking. Everybody has to have an open mind to... Okay, what, what else is there? Why do they want that? And how can we put this in perspective and, and getting away from the black and white thinking? Because the world is changing, that's right. But to shape this together is, is the important part. And I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I see things coming over from Europe that we are like five years behind. And it's going to come here too. Well, it's wild how it seems as though the concern for the environment and things like climate change and, and saving planet earth has superseded people's understanding of, of the basis of our civilization, which is food and energy and specifically in Germany, trying to go really green. And at the same time, more or less making deals with Russia and China for energy and, and food has led to a lot of inflation in the price of a bushel of wheat in a unit of energy and left manufacturing and their whole society, kind of like us, where we are impeding the flow of oil and looking at regulating agriculture uh, with some poor choices. Uh, so I don't know if people understand that you're going to be cold and you're going to be hungry and you're going to be broke at some point with some of the choices. that, I, And it's not that black and white. Like you say, things are always gray. But uh, I think it's really interesting to look at where you guys have gone and say, and accept the reality that this is probably coming and we need to write our own story in that regard to some degree. And that's where a guy like Christian, who spent big bucks as far as a farmer goes on building that advocacy and that marketing in order to get into the halls of, of the regulatory folks is something that we should all be supporting. Cause if, if somebody doesn't stand up and say something and educate, who's going to do that, Marcel, but I think maybe you should run for office by the sounds of our talk today. <laughs> yeah. Well, I became a Canadian last year, so <laughs> there you go. That. Before, before you can't do that if you don't have your passport. But no, hey, I appreciate that. But that's that's way above my that's way above my intelligent level. So, but you're you're right. Like somebody has to say something, right? That's the thing. Somebody has to educate. That's right. Because if you don't say something, you you have no input at all, which is even worse. Because the world is changing. That's just one of those things. And. And, you know, you just touched on it, but somebody said once, you know, without agriculture, we would all be hungry, sober and naked. Right. So I keep, sober, <laughs> yeah, sober, uh, hungry, sober and naked. And I, that, I didn't, I didn't invent that. So I can't take credit for that. But it's true. 
you know, well, so much comes from the agricultural output. It's incredible. I don't think any of us really realize the full impact of that. If you could see the whole food chain, but, uh, did you have any inkling that you were going to go global like you have when you were a young man in university, uh, working on farms on the side? That I would work in different farm, uh, different well, countries. Well, that you would you go mean? global. Yeah, that you would go global. That you would live somewhere else. That you would have a company <laughs> that would be in thirty-three yeah. different com- countries around the world. No, this is. If you would have told me this, you know, fifteen years ago, I would have, I would have just shaken my head and not thought. I can't believe it. It's this is this has been quite a journey. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a roller coaster. So that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely. So you had your internship, way. you had your education. How was the education? You you learned a few things. Yeah, it was basically a year of diploma, uh, ag diploma to compare it here. And then uh, three and a half years of uh, university, like ag engineering, uh, which is now like they were, they were just transforming this into bachelor of science degrees to match it with international uh, degrees. But in Germany, that, that ag that ag agriculture, which is like a mix of ag engineering and agronomy and, and animal science to, combined. And then you choose where you want to do your, your major in. And that was always my side was technical and, and, and soil science. Um, and then I wrote my, my thesis. I wrote at a large German uh, combine manufacturer there to, about telematics back in the day. So you've applied some of what you've learned in your company, in your, in your inventions and in how you approach things? Yeah, I, I was, I'm, I'm, I was very fortunate to work with people. You know, we, I worked on the smallest fields in the world. I worked on the largest fields in the world and with entrepreneurial companies, startups, farms, but then also the corporate side of, you know, Cargill and, and other large companies and manufacturers where you realize what is good was it's what is efficient and, and what other things could be applied? Um, yeah, no, I, I I learned a lot. So I'm again, I'm I'm glad and I'm grateful for everybody that I've worked with in the past because it's been it it's been a, a roller coaster, and you have you've learned something every time, good and bad. So your was it your international experience in countries like Russia and and Brazil that that helped you see that there was a bigger opportunity abroad? How did that go? Uh, the the real first hunger about the international stuff was really when I was working on that pig farm and the son of the farmer was in Canada for about a, almost a year and he came back with pictures, you know, that was before smartphone times. He had like the, the pictures all like, you know, you had to go to the store and get them all done and the pictures came in and he brought, I, he brought Crown Royal back. You know, nice. and then we we sat there at night and he showed me those pictures of these massive semi trucks, these fields. Where and where combines. was he that he took pictures? He was in Ontario. Okay. Uh, in the in the London area, but yeah. then they bought a car and drove all the way through Canada, and then they worked in northern Alberta. Oh. Wow. And then they they came back home, and you know he's like, you got to go to Canada. Like someday you got to go. And, and I I went for one summer and you know in the university break in the summer. And I worked in Southern Manitoba. I worked in Roland, Manitoba for three months. Nice. Good old Roland, Manitoba. And that was the first time Canada. And that kind of opened my eyes to, wow, what's this is, you know, I thought I thought I, I had seen it all after that. And then really? a year later, yeah, because it was 4,000 acres, you know, massive tractors, four-wheel drives, big combines, you know, 10, 10 meter, like 35 foot headers. And then I go back home and, <laughs> and I go back home and you 10 acres. And then I see this ad for that farm in Russia that wanted to grow a farm from zero to 80,000 acres in three years. I was like, uh, that's where I'm going to put my application in. I want a more adventure. Adventure was always my thing. But um, what I learned in all going to all these different places is harvest is something that's always in my brain kind of thing. My, for that doesn't stop in my, in my, it always kind of goes around. And I saw the same things in every country, you know, farmers and drivers were doing the same things with the combines or not doing the things that we, sh- we, we could be doing. And that kind of triggered something in my brain. I went like, well, if, if this is everywhere the same, like, why don't we, how can we do something about it? But the international stuff came really from the son of my boss, which was a, a cool dude. Still, uh, I'm going to see him next week. Going to, we're going to Germany next week to Agritechnica oh, God, for the I'm big jealous. show. 
next week. Yeah. You know? uh, we're leaving next week and the show is the week after. So it's, uh, Makes it's pretty exciting. The very first time for Busher Plus to have a booth there. That's going to be going to be cool. It's big. I can't oh. imagine the energy from the show. That's probably the first one back since, well, maybe they had it in COVID, but it was probably pretty truncated. It was probably pretty. Brief. No, this is, this is the first time. This yeah. must be quite the energy here now. Um, they did the SEMA show in France, but not not the one in Germany. Yeah. Yeah, you sure feel that with events now, although some of the events are maybe smaller for various reasons, but I, I don't expect Agritechnica would be much much smaller. But what did uh, what did Mother Russia teach you? <laughs> um, you know, it's a, a lot of improvising and adventure. <laughs> <laughs> so and maybe before i answer that please let me say one thing okay there is a lot of things in the news right now right about and, it, and it's horrible what's happening um and let, let me just say this okay um there is a lot of good people in every country it's it's unfortunate what politics can do to a country okay and and when i worked there i met some of the nicest people i've ever met and the host, the hospitality there is absolutely amazing. It's mm -hmm. you know you you would you would be invited to somebody, and it it could be the poorest family and the poorest household in that little town, but that table is full of food. That's their pride. And don't you dare say you had enough or you're full. <laughs> no, no, Babushka is gonna tell you to eat more, right? Like yeah. grandma. Is gonna say no, no, kushit, kushit is like the Russian word for eating. It's a like, kushit, Marcel. Bye bye. <laughs> so you, you're gonna keep eating. Um, I went there, I saw this ad. They were gonna build this investment farm. Two German guys. They were trying. They were running it with a, through a big fund in uh, Western Russia, right on the border to the Ukraine. So I've been right there where all the stuff is happening. Right where all the unfortunate stuff is happening. Our headland was right on the border. Where was like in, that, Marcel? Uh, it's between Bryansk, but it's Bryanskaya Oblast, and uh, further south is Kursk. So if you look on the map, Bryansk is very close to, I think it's the M3 highway that goes into the Ukraine from Moscow to Kiev. And um, it's, um, they wanted to build that farm, and they started with zero acres a year before, and they seeded just about 20,000 acres. And the first harvest, that's what they were looking for people to run combines and teach people on combines and you know look after the seeding in the fall because it's all fall seeded. Um, and I talked to the, the German farmer or the, the, the farm manager, I should say. Uh, I talked to him and we, I don't know, we just hit it off. And in the interview, we met in the interview once in, um, in Germany and he looks at me like, so, and he looks at me and he said, yeah, you're nuts enough to come over there. I said, yeah, and yeah, and, you're a fit. <laughs> yeah. And, and I said to him, and you're nuts enough to be there already. So, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're good friends until today. Um, so then I tried to do a Russian course besides university. And I'm not a, I'm not a school, like a, like a school room learner and a book learner. Not at all. Like I've, everybody else had Russian parents or Russian grandparents in that course. And I was the only one who couldn't keep up. I was like, you know, I'll just going to go. And I remember the English, uh, the Russian teacher said like, you're not going to get anywhere in Russia. I said, well, we'll figure that one out when we get there. So then uh, I knew two or three words. And then I, I didn't, I, I don't speak Russian fluent, but I picked up enough to set up combine, set up machine. I could talk to people on the phone, you know, two-way radio stuff, set up combines because I was looking after a bunch of combines. I went back the second year too. So it was all hands and feet, hands and feet. And <laughs> it was funny. It was so funny. And, you know, you learn the swear words first. Uh, that's what they <laughs> like to teach you first. Um, yeah. and, um, and if you show them, if you show them that you care and that you want to learn their language and work with them, and you don't come there as the arrogant German, I'll tell you how it works. If you don't have that attitude, which is very much not me, then, you know, they, they open up to you. But in the beginning, it's like a wall. Like, it's very much so, yeah, okay. So you have to earn the respect and you have to like, where well, Canada is very open, right? It's like, Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. That doesn't happen over there. It's like, it's like a wall, but once that wall is kind of down, like I said before, the hospitality is amazing and they have different culture again, right? You have to hand handshake 
every man at the job, you have to greet by handshake. So if you come to the farm in the morning and there's already 30 people kind of around the tractors, so you're like shaking 30 people's hands. And that's you know, going to that be tough in COVID. <laughs> yeah, that was pre COVID. So it's, I don't know how they do it now, but <laughs> I don't know if they can. virtual high five. Yeah. Like, see ya. Good morning. So it's, uh, <laughs> I had to learn that. And, you know, it's a lot of improvising, but, you know, your harvest, you're like, I was 19, 20 years old there at the time, right? And you have all of a sudden you have responsibility for like a dozen combines and you're harvesting. The second year we harvested 50,000 acres. And then Marcel runs around between all these people and organizing all these logistical. So I was in charge of setting up the logistics, setting up the combines, which field is harvested next, grain carts and the trucks, all that logistics and the documentation on the fields. So, and, and you do all these things and it's, it was, it was a big project. It was some of the best time of my life. It was cool. It was a lot of fun. Did they get to 80,000 acres? Yeah, they got to 80,000 acres. Yeah, I didn't, I, I moved to Canada, uh, instead of going there full time, um, after, after all these projects were done or well, some of the, like after my thesis was done, I should say. Um, but yeah, they, they got to it. Yeah. What has become of them now? That's a good question. So, um, when, the, so a couple of years ago, when, um, the whole war started there, um, that, that farm was actually sold and they started a new farm in a different area. So good move. Yeah. <laughs> they start, well, but also still it's actually not far away. So, but not far away. So they're still kind of close to that area. I was just sold and, but yeah. it's Russia now. Yeah. It's Russia now. Well, sorry, I wasn't in the Ukraine. Okay. I was on the Russian side. Oh, it's a, it was always on the Russian side. Yeah. yeah. I was always on the Russian yeah. side. Sorry. I don't want to yeah. confuse anybody here because it's, you know, for some people, this is also a touchy topic, but yeah, you know, it, when the area I was working, like there was Russians and Ukrainians, like it was very much, you know, everybody had family across the border. And that's what breaks my heart to see these things, right? Because everybody has families on both sides of the border. Like it, it really, it, it, it breaks my heart to see that kind of stuff for, for the people that are involved on both sides, yeah. because yeah. there's people dying and, and, and losing family members and wrecking their lives and these kind of things. And it's, it's sad. It's, yeah. That whole Eastern side of yeah. Ukraine is, is quite, quite Russian in a lot of places. Um, yeah. That's got to be, that's got to be, that's got to be incredible. Well, hopefully they're still doing good over there and who knows, hopefully things will get settled here one day and there'll be peace again soon. Um, I, I Amen to that. I can just second that. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's been a, it was quite the thing. And then my boss always choked. He's like, ah, oh, we just have, we just have a hobby farm. You should go work for my old boss. Cause when he went to Russia, he worked for this larger farm that at that point they were close to a million acres. And I was the largest dairy farmer in Russia at the time. So then he actually organized that for me that I was able to work one week on that farm, which was more central Russia, Voronezh area. So I drove there by train. They have these night trains and you have those rooms where there's like four bunk beds in, or you can be in a wagon with like 56 other people and there's just bunk <laughs> beds everywhere. And it's just, and then you're like 12 hours in that train which half the train is partying, the other half is sleeping, the other is playing cards, like very social. It's, people are very social over there. Um, so I drove 12 hours with that train to central Russia and, and toured around with some of the Russian, and there was one German agronomist too. They were just harvesting beets. And it was, it was, it was interesting to see that because it, it was just our, our job also there was like teaching and training because, you know, you, you had brand new equipment. Like we had a 98, 70 STS combines, John Deere, they came, we were just coming out that year and they were brand new with touch screens, everything, you know, yield mapping. And then you teach people by hand and feet, how to work these touch screens who've never flushed the toilet in their lives. Cause they don't have running water in some of those small towns in the countryside, you know? So mm -hmm because they all have an outhouse out yet. They all have natural gas, but not running water. They still have a well in there. And you can see, I get pretty passionate about it because it's, for me, it was a cool adventure. And I love these, I love that time. And I love the people that I met there. 
because they taught me a lot. And, and, you know, if you have a good town, you have a pump like this, but if it's a town that's a bit more <laughs> poor, then you have a, like a rope and a bucket and down yeah. the hole it goes. So yeah, Friday man. night, you drive through a town and there's the, there the, you know, the guys and the girls getting ready for a Friday night party. And they like letting the bucket down to get some water to get ready. And we were like, we were in the middle of nowhere there in some of those areas. Right. So Incredible. it's very interesting. And, you know, we, you out of water for some days because that summer was, was a very, was a drought and it was lots of wildfires and there was no water. So in the morning it was dripping water out of the cranes and we would fill up one liter, like, like water bottle, like empty water bottles or like Coca-Cola bottles and would fill them up with water so we could shower at night with like Jeez. everybody had like, <laughs> or we would take water from, from like a pond somewhere. Like it was just, <laughs> it was just an adventure. But then back to the central Russia farm, I got fortunate to meet the owner of the farm who happened to be uh, a German, a complete accident. Just, just funny how sometimes life turns out. And then he invited me for, to, to sit together for a chat. And he said, do you have any other questions? I said, yeah, I heard you farm in Siberia as well. You have a farm there because these million acres I mentioned are not all in one spot. They're like in multiple different farms. Okay. They're all split up. And he said, yeah, we farm in Siberia. Um, why don't you go see that and check that out? How, how long is your visa good for? I said, uh, another three weeks. He goes, well, here's my HR lady. She speaks German as well in English. Like you figured it out. Then two days later, I had my, my ticket via email. <laughs> and he's like, you go there, you check it out. You see what we can do. You let me know what we can do better. And then let me know if you want to drop there. I was like, uh, okay. So then I <laughs> don't know anybody in Siberia, right? Back on the train, Marcel goes all the way to Moscow through the subways in moscow which is some of the most beautiful subways you'll ever see like uh, they're all like have you ever seen that they're like a uh, a church down there like it's very clean like there's pictures everywhere and art and it's like an old church but guess what everything is in kirill language right sorry i keep <laughs> right. i keep hugging i keep hugging that your microphone here oh it's, um, it's a it's a wonderful so, microphone i don't blame you yeah it's it's awesome love it <laughs> um, so here's marcel learning how to read kirill meanwhile the russian teacher told me it's never going to work and then you're like in the subway in moscow trying to get to the airport flying to siberia and then there's a person that picks me up in novosibirsk airport with just a page, my first page of my resume, just like waving it. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess that's the guy. That's me. <laughs> and then you know, we can do a full podcast on just this one week in Siberia because the things you've, it was in the middle of nowhere there uh, with like, a, like almost like a log cabin in the woods that I was <laughs> staying there because that was like the cabin of, of like for guests and the farm manager and the, the, the countryside was just beautiful. It's like it was like Canada, and massive fields, very different agriculture. They were plowing out there. There was a lot of rainfall. There was corn silage being harvested. There was like dairy barns being built, and then you go to a different area in Siberia, and it's just a, it's just a desert. So it's a, it's a very fascinating country. But you know, I was again very fortunate to have those chances, um, and you know, people in school laughed at me. An apprenticeship school and university like oh marcel like the hobby farmer right like oh, i can't and then but you know you were kind of disheartened when that happened but in in hindsight now i was able to do all these things because i didn't have to go home that summer and work on the farm at home so you know i'm it's yeah i didn't have a big farm at home to go back to but on the other hand it gave me opportunity to work on these other things and you have the, uh, these other experiences so yeah perspective I mean, folks oh, that never leave the farm. Big time perspective. You know, um, I'm a big history fan. And, you know, first, like Second World War and, and this kind of this time after. And, you know, I read lots of stories about this. And a lot of these towns have not changed since. And, you know, some of those town names in the history that's there, it's, it's been, you know, we, we found old pieces of, of, of like tanks there and chains of tanks and stuff like that and you know some people would find grenades in the field and stuff like that it's just been very very different 
I don't think we have any perspective in North America how large World War II looms in the minds of those folks over there because it never happened on our soil. And we lost folks. We all lost somebody, you know, um, you know, related to us in the war at some point, you know. But oh yeah. And it's, it's it, they're still finding bombs today. Like they we we at the university town city, I should say, I went to er, you know, every couple of years there would be a whole area of the city would be evacuated. Because somebody found a bomb out of the Second World War that they was dropped, uh, um, and they have to they have to de um, debunk it, demine it. Thank you. See, I'm maybe you'll have to everything. invent something when we have peace in that eastern part of Ukraine, because that's the most heavily mined part of the world now. How would you go back and farm? Oh, it's it's sad. It's super sad. And you know, I've seen on YouTube some of those inventions that they built to demine some of those fields, and the ingenuity of those people, and how they help themselves, and how they can fix stuff. That's what I saw out there. They could help. They could fix anything. Doesn't matter what it was. They could fix it. You know, we, the second year we bought CR combines in addition to the John Deere's, and there was a uh, there was a uh, the chain on the side of the feeder house. Uh, the sprocket just went, and um, we didn't have that part anywhere. So they went into some kind of wrecking yard and they, they ripped <laughs> they ripped something off an old potato harvester and put it into some CNC machine and in the lace, whatever they had, and boom, it was done. It was running. It wasn't perfect, but it ran. It has to run. That's where I learned it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It has to work. You know. That's a fascinating I mean, thing about Russia. I mean, Siberia has to be as far from Moscow as we are from Toronto out here farther, maybe that's, that's further oh, way farther yet. And I'm, yeah, I don't have my, uh, measure tape here right now in my world. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's I mean, far. in terms of, of, of development and, and, and outlook and well, I guess I shouldn't say, cause we're quite modern here in Western, Western Canada, where I assume Siberia is still lots of those places are still fairly rudimentary and, 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 um, you know, there's a lot of poverty, but and they live in a beautiful part of the world. But I don't think the rest of Russia has been modernized the way the way Canada would be. I just imagine. I'm just I'm just making not the, the, the cities, of course. Yeah, the cities are good everywhere. It's it's the it's a countryside. It's like in 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 nowhere, far away, removed from kind of I shouldn't say civilization, but some of the villages. Like I said, there is no. Some of them have no running water. Right? They have in Siberia. They have the banya like the Russian sauna, the equivalent of that, which is a lot warmer than a normal sauna. And then uh, they, they basically have these, um, these um, birch um, trees, like the, the branches of that. And, and that's what they basically hit. Like you hit that on your skin and that's what basically brings all, opens up the pores. I don't want to be gross or anything, but that's <laughs> like opens up the pores and, yeah. and that gets all the, everything out of your skin and you feel like a newborn after but mm. that's that's what they do a few times through the week but they don't have running they don't have a shower in the house but or other water sources that they use in instead but the banya is one of those things in, in those areas at least where i was okay like bear with me here that siberia is massive so i i can only speak about this little part that i've seen that uh but that that's what they do there and and here's the other thing though they're happy those small towns where you drive through and you think it's like a poor town, they're happy. And that's Why is something, that? you know, and that's something I've been thinking about a lot because, you know, they sit there at any the evening, they sit there and chat with the neighbors, they sit in front of their houses on the banks and they're always social. You know, they have their own pigs in the backyard, a horse, a couple of cows that they have their own meat, their, maybe to their own chicken and their own chickens and stuff. And it's, um, they're happy. They have everything you need, content. And again, I can't speak for everybody, okay? Please, this is my humble opinion here. But it is all this, you know, consuming more, consuming more, and having everything and all the fancy stuff is not, it's not fulfilling for everything. That's not, that's not needed to, to a degree. And again, I'm getting a bit... Uh, uh, not emotional, but for, I don't want to be a, 
philosophical or whatever the word is. Now I'm really struggling with my English. Philosophical. Here, well, I think you, you make go. a great point. Terry experienced that when he went over with Canadian Food Grains Bank to uh, to Africa. I think they were in Ethiopia. And he said, you know, the strange thing is they don't really have any word for depression. Mm. Like they don't have any, you know, the mental health thing over there is it's different because I think they're at that point of survival where it's, you know, Every day you have so much to do just to get the basics. You don't have a lot of time to sit in Starbucks and ponder, you know, your existence of, oh, geez, what about this? And what, oh, why can't I do the, you know, uh, why can't I be like this? Why can't I be like Marcel, oh, you God. know, on Twitter <laughs> and be giving people and Brandon give me awards and, you know, whatever we, we tend to compare and, and worry about getting to the next thing. But, but out there, life is probably a straight line and you probably just enjoy the flow of, small things like you know gardening and and uh you know raising animals and and being out in nature and and socializing like you say it's more of a community feel so i don't know how we kind of have both the the, you know the best of both worlds uh maybe we need to move into the brandon hills you know and start a bit of a yeah you and me let's let's start that and (laughs) yeah it's but you but you're right you know it's like (laughs) I mean, comparing yourself to others is that's that's a tough part, right? So that that's oh, especially always, in business, right? It kills you in business. It it kills you, and it's you know you never know what somebody's going through. You know, like you just made an example. Oh, why can I be Marcel? Well, I probably don't want to be me. Like it's been it's been a lot of sleepless nights, but and and enough stress every day, which is an emotional and uh, entrepreneurial roller coaster, which I'm sure you you know you you know all about it. Uh, but back to these these people, right there. They were, they were happy, but also they have to do things, as you said, to survive. And the thing takes longer. I remember my great grandma making butter on the farm. You know, they were stamping butter in these things with like, where they had to like, they call in German stamp butter. So it took them a while to do that. Right. Well, how long does you and me, how long does it take you or me to get butter today? Yeah. Go to a grocery store, a couple minutes, you're done. Right. So now all of a sudden you have four more hours that day to worry about some other crap. I'm just pissed off and annoyed when I run on a stick of butter and I'm trying to, you know, make some bacon and eggs here. It's like, oh, what am I going to go to 7 Eleven now? And, you know, great grandma had to go to the, to go to the barn and, and get the milk first and get that planned out. Right. Or, you know, my, like just making the food for the winter time, cooking all that stuff into the glasses. I'm, I don't, I don't have the proper English term for this, but they were cooking all this stuff in those pre classes to get to the winter time. And it's it's not that we lived in the middle of nowhere and we had electricity and everything and running water, but it's just they were used to this from back in the day. And the one of my apprenticeship farms, uh, the grandma there, she always said, um, I try to translate it here, but she always said, like, oh, all these, this modern world, she, she goes, um, she said, all these people, they have to work with a shovel again. Like, because basically she's like more people have to work with a shovel again because yeah when you're when you're shoveling all day you're doing something physical like it's it's some hard work it's like and i know not everybody can do that don't get me wrong i have enough office jobs and everything else always had but that was kind of her thing of people got to get out again and you know like appreciation of something that you got built and not just get everything but like yeah what, what, what do you that think I see, I, when i was in well when i was in uh what that one I have distinct memory when I was in Moscow looking out one of these you know Soviet style apartment blocks and looking down when it had just freshly snowed and they were sh- they were shoveling these huge open areas these parking lots or walkways or whatever with not shovels like the, not like the ergonomic super cool multiple handle like molded plastic like space age you know shovels with multi purpose things that we get from Canadian Tire today it was upside down sign square sign. And snow was going off the sides. I'm like, can't you, can't you shape that thing? Like, but it was all, all was like, they talk about when you travel, there's, there's different stages. And one is sort of the wonderland. Oh, okay. I'm in, you know, this, you know, Alice in Wonderland or Narnia or whatever, like everything's so fantastic and you kind of idealize everything. But then there's this stage where it's like, okay, you can't accept how different everything is. And it kind of pisses you off and drives you crazy. But if you stay somewhere long enough, you have to accept that this is the way it is and you have to integrate it. And I think that's the way I saw Russians. It's just, there was less diversity there. You know, you go to a school here in Brown, I did egg in the classroom. There's 26 different languages. You wouldn't experience that in, in Russia. 
but well, and, and where I wasn't, where I saw anyways, but, but at the same time, you know, they look more like us than it does. Like people, they look more uniform. People are more like us in, in Russia. Like everybody is basically white as far, as far as I could see, but they were so different from us. Like you say, the language and the way they think and, and the way they are with strangers too in public, they're not nearly as warm. I think it's considered rude. If you start, you know, chatting somebody up in Sobeys in Russia, <laughs> what, you know, I don't know exactly what that is, but I just, I yeah. want to say Marcel, if I could, um, this thing about happiness. And I, and I do have a bit of a theory here because I read a book recently called flow and to sum it up, they talk about the different kinds of flow that they actually measured what makes people happy. And so okay. they, they they did this research, and of course, this is you know a couple of decades ago, and it's gone into different branches of coaching and education and whatever. But what they studied was they gave people pagers and they check in with them eight times a day, and then they had to write down what they were doing and how they felt about it at the time, and what they come to understand over these thousands of people with all these little pagers, um, that there is happiness in in what they call flow and they define flow two different ways. One was you're an artist or you're an engineer or you're a musician or you're, you know, a scientist or or you're somebody doing math, you know, you get absolutely lost in it. The hours go by, maybe you're an entrepreneur, you know, you just, you totally forget yourself. You forget all your problems and you're just working on that thing that you love, you know, top athletes experience that flow. They're not thinking about anything else. If you're swimming in the Olympics or you're, playing football in Europe or you're a Formula One car driver or whatever. But but uh, there's another kind of flow that people, and, and the, they talk about even in the most dire circumstances, you could have been, they, they talk about this in Auschwitz. And uh, there's a famous book by a guy that was in Auschwitz talking about how he found peace and happiness in his own mind. But it's, yes. it's doing yeah. those small everyday things. And they gave the analogy of a guy working on a, on a poem in, in, in a, in a prison and there was maybe no hope of ever getting out of there, but the, they made a game or, or a system of like memorizing to each of the inmates would memorize a couple lines of this poem that he wrote. And when they got out, they would share it with his wife. And, and so they have this whole poem and, and, but just small things like that. And whether it's, you know, making butter or, gardening or working on something simple or whatever it is you can find flow in those really mundane things if you're present and flow is is happiness versus the rude discovery that all the things that we work for in life that we think are going to make us happy when we get to a certain level it's it's a rude betrayal when we get there because god damn it it didn't really make us happy we're actually, as entrepreneurs, we're always thinking about the next thing. It's we never celebrate our wins. Like, yeah. you're a big deal. You've you've done like you've succeeded. You come from nothing. You came over here with nothing. You built built a multi million dollar company that's all over the world. You have twenty some thirty some employees, whatever it is now since the last update. You know, when when will you feel that sort of satisfaction? Like the person in the village that's hauling the water or making the butter or you know, weeding in the garden or visiting with a neighbor, maybe never if we're just confined to that. So I've really thought about that flow and I have really worked at trying to make simple things more enjoyable and just enjoy whatever it is, whatever the task is, you know, as bachelors, we have to do some things for ourselves. So, you know, like what can we do with (laughs) the simple things? Uh to be happy in that, you know, because getting rich and famous as an entrepreneur isn't going to do it. It is not going to do it. And that's the hard part is when you get there, you're like, damn. Well, I'm not rich and I'm not rich and famous yet. So I'm I'm behind you there. Dude, but that's the problem. (laughs) That is the problem. You you don't see that. You don't feel that, but everybody else looks at you and goes, wow, you know, entrepreneur of the year and making big speeches at the chamber of commerce. And we see you everywhere, you know, on all the platforms and you look really happy, but nobody, you know, when we were doing this podcast, you're like, can we do it 11 AM on Saturday? Cause I, I only got two hours of sleep, you know, the night before, and it has been a crazy week and you're working on things for Europe. I mean, you're driven, you're obsessed, but is that, is that happiness for you? <laughs> you I, I liked it. I liked that. How you put, how you set me up for that question. That's good. <laughs> I like how you read that book. Um, you know, it, that's a, that's a very, very interesting question. I, I, like I mentioned before, like my brain doesn't really stop. It keeps 
it's always thinking and that is probably a blessing and a curse at the same time um and and yeah you you're right it's as entrepreneurs we we don't really take time to celebrate that success it's probably one of the things that people tell me the most in my team you know my, my team sees uh that i'm very passionate for them and and, and do a lot of things for them and i'm very grateful for them and i want to do a lot of things for them but they also tell me like, hey marcel like you know it's a uh, it's okay if you take some time for yourself sometime, right? And make sure you celebrate <laughs> that win because I want to celebrate them because I'm already to the next. I'm already thinking about, okay, what else can we do better? What's, what's the next step? How do we stay relevant? How do we, how do we survive, right? It's, it's a business that has to survive. My responsibility is to, to look after our customers and also our, our employees, you know, their families to feed. And we have now, you mentioned it, like we have now 30 employees and growing. Um, and I've never would have believed it when I started by myself. Um, is that happy? Well, part of parts of it are happy. You know, I'm, I'm not, we can talk bushel plus, we can talk entrepreneurship, we can talk challenges in life. You know, you can probably have five podcasts, but the entrepreneurship thing is an emotional roller coaster. Not every day is great and not every day is happy. There's a lot of stress and there is a lot of things on, on my mind, especially I, I care a lot about what we do and the customers and, and who we are and, and our employees. I do truly care a lot about that. And, uh, you know, I put that pressure on myself. It, part of it is happiness. Yeah. But as you say, you know, sometimes doing, not doing that is also happy. You know, the happiest thing for me, put me on a forage harvester. There's two things. Put me on a forage harvester and <laughs> let me chop corn silage all day. Yeah. Okay, that's where that's my that's my thing. Or throw me in a clown's costume and let and let me run through a children's hospital, one or the other. It's mm -hmm. or like let me run through like an old folks home. I I did that when I was in Australia, uh, when I was getting better in the hospital. I did go to other patients that were in worse shape yet, and I went to them and talked to them. So that's when you realize, okay, giving something to other people is something that gives you something back. Helping others. That's that's some of those things I'm trying to trying to do where yes the company we can talk about the company and how we support stars and other things but you know if you ask me personal i was at a couple of years ago i was i was driving food around for um for some of those organizations here in brandon right because it's it's because it's it's cool you meet people you do something you do something for your community um so and and not everybody is as fortunate uh as somebody else that can afford the food or can pick it up and all those kind of things. And some elderly people live by themselves and can't do these things. Um, so other things put basically more happiness back in your glass. If that's what makes sense. Yeah. Fill your cup, fill your cup with different things. It's definitely not buying more stuff. That's not me. You know, I still wear clothing that I had at high school. Or that I had ten years ago. Like when I was, my friends did a, the brand. My Brandon friends did like a photo book for me, and they're like Marcel, like we looked all of these pictures from your last eleven years here, and you wear the same winter jacket all the time. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, but it still works. <laughs> like, and all these other jackets I got mm. from some chem companies for free, right? And I wear those. Like, I Perfectly no, functional fashion. <laughs> I have no shame in that at all because it's yeah. You should be proud for myself. For myself, I'm very cheap, but for my friends and our employees, I want to make sure they're taken care of and they have what they can do to survive or do their job. It's very mm -hmm. different for me. Those are two different things uh, for me. But that forage harvester, that, that's me. So if anybody's listening and needs a forage harvester driver, <laughs> um, contact us through bushelplus.com. Send us an email. <laughs> do you so think, though, that? given who you are and how dynamic you are and how intense you are and all the things in your head that if you were a full-time forage harvester operator forever, I mean that you would be satisfied because you, you'd want to create that stuff. And like a big part of what you do has got to be the invention and sharing that invention and seeing it work. Yeah. You know, I've done the forage harvesting thing, right? I moved to Canada. Exactly. And I lived on this forage harvester for three years. So I've, I've done that part. And I exactly. was at the point where it's like, ah, there has to be more out there. You know, I'm kind of yeah. losing my agronomy background and what else can we do? And if I would have, if I would sit on the forage harvester now again for the rest of my life, I would probably start thinking about, okay, how can we run two? How can we make this more efficient? 
How can we add a third one? How can we connect them? How can we uh, can get more acres to chop? It would, that's kind of my, my nature without sounding arrogant about it. Not at all. I, I don't There's want to There's nothing arrogant like that. about that. So though. striving for improvement. I wouldn't be humble about that because you know, the challenge I think you'd find when you're, if you're working for others, you can't always implement the changes that you want. You can yeah, suggest that's, that's them. A, but... That's the issue. I'm probably unemployable by now with, <laughs> as an entrepreneur, you know, because you have true. all these ideas and you try. So, well, <laughs> I think you learn to filter them over time, especially if you have a lot of people that are always wondering like, what's in your head now and what are you going to blow up with all your ideas? But having that ability to implement something on a dime and and see how it works and you know fail fast this is one of the funnest things about being a small business entrepreneur yeah and it's appreciated from our employees too you know we just hired uh we just hired more people and you know they come from very diverse backgrounds and uh different com different companies and you know one of the things they said to me after the first two weeks they're like i can't i i said i like they they are so uh, impressed. I'm looking for the right word. They, they were saying they're impressed and surprised by the speed we make decisions here yeah. and how they are supported. And it, it's, don't get me wrong. Marcel is not make in every decision in the business with 30 employees. I don't want to be a micromanager. We want to hire people that feel fulfilled in their jobs and they hire to do a job. And I want, there's nothing funner for me and better than seeing people grow and develop and learn, and then taking this stuff on and and making this project and finalizing that project head on. So some of them came from some pretty big companies and, um, and some startup, ex startup experience and like, wow, we made this decision in like a couple hours or, you know, we invent new concaves pretty fast. We have some really cool stuff coming here throughout the winter time. And some of the stuff, you know, we've seen in the field in August, we went back to drawing board. We, you know, my napkin drawings and other teams' napkins drawings too. Like we have a really good team. It's not just me having ideas. That's, it's not me. I'm on a lot of like advertising in my face out there a lot, but I want to emphasize how cool this team is and how dedicated they are at Bush Plus. So we're taking those drawings and ideas, putting it into the, the program, laser cut the parts, put it together. And like four days later, the stuff is in the combine. And all of a sudden we have something in the combine in the States and in Canada and testing it. And a month later we go, wow, this, this is incredible results. What do we do with it? And you know, it's, it's not for everybody cause it's fast. It's very fast pace. And there's a, there's a lot of things going on that people have to have to keep track of. Cause while you're doing all these innovation things, your normal business day to day is still going. And you got to look after your employees and your customers while you're still doing all this other stuff. There's this like shiny light syndrome, right? You cannot just always jump for the next shiny light because that means you don't grow the proper framework to, to grow in, you know, but we pride ourselves in our four brand pillars, you know, of, you know, farmer success, continuous innovation, quality experience, and technical excellence. Those are things that, you know, we stand by and if a farmer needs something or a customer, we, we make it right. Um, and we want to be, we want to be, you know, you see it behind me, like we just rebranded this year as, you know, we are the harvest optimization company where um, our vision is to drastically reduce, uh, sorry, drastically increase. Sorry. Now I'm completely butchered that one. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'm like, I just concentrated so much on saying it properly. <laughs> we want to we want to increase global food production by drastically reducing harvest loss out there, right? So it, well, it, you talked about the numbers in Canada. I, I think you're referring to it. If at your speech at the Brandon Chamber of Commerce here recently, that you sent me the video of, you said if if everybody had calibrated your combines with your equipment, it would be not a, like you know, another billion bucks of of green going out or something like that close to it the 900 well, million well well there was an example of um they wanted me to bring some examples and i said there's thirteen thousand combines in saskatchewan alone Thirteen thousand combines in saskatchewan and if every combine would only save like one bushel per acre right just one bushel just yeah. and you would have x amount of x amount or oh, per acre so there was the acre number and i don't have them with me right now but it was an acre number how many combines and then I asked the audience who wasn't in agriculture, how many more loaves right. of bread do you think we can bake with that? 
and it, it was like a couple of billion worth of like loaves of bread. If I have, if I remember the slide properly, I don't want to say anything wrong, but it's, it's a lot, you know, we, we work with research station Australia and they were figuring out there's $300 million of grain being wasted in one of the Western States every year, like lost out of the combine. You know, there is a lot of grain and food yet that we want to put back in the food supply chain because it's there, it's, it's grown already. And I know I, we're completely on a different topic right now, all of a sudden, but that's how it works, right? You jump from one thing to the next. Um, we did that episode on yeah. harvest optimization. I talked to Donald, the farm foreman, and in his quote there, if I remember correctly, they added another couple hundred thousand bucks to the inheritance for the non-farming siblings last year because because they were able to optimize stuff with with your equipment and it's made a made a big deal i, I actually talked to terry about the the little combine too the mini combine that you guys have so you don't have to take out the big oh, yeah. ass lexion that's a million bucks you can have a handheld that's whatever i'm sure it's uh probably a couple thousand bucks maybe or maybe maybe not even that mini combine but the difference yeah, about that. Us, yeah. So yeah, I could, I could, I could probably price it oh, pretty good that way. The sales, sales guy. Yeah, you're a good sales. You're, you're a good sales person. <laughs> yeah. But what no, it's, I want all about, I, I, we've been going all, all over, all over yeah. the health South acre here, but I love it. Cause it all, right. who cares? Yeah. It all ties together. <laughs> I, I sense up three, you know, three to five part series uh, looming here. So it's yeah, digestible. It be. Well, hopefully they're wedded, wed, their appetite was wedded by this story of you growing up in the hills, the mountains of Germany, but I wanted to back up the truck there. You were talking about how you guys have the speed of decision making. Are you worried at all that as you get bigger, you might lose that or that might slow down? Because it will, it will. You can't be as quick and as nimble and operate like you did as a small startup as you get bigger. And then you'll get bought and then you'll really be sitting there as okay. the founder on the payroll, banging your head against the wall, wondering maybe I should go build something else. Because I can't do what I used to do, which is innovate at the speed of sound. Yeah, let, let's not go that far to the to the bot piece because it's me, it, it's me and the team, and and that's what's exciting. And um, yes, you're right. You, you cannot be as nimble all the time. You know, we're going into thirty employees and more. Um, however, technically, we are not a startup anymore, but the culture is still very much alive. And we're hiring by personality, okay? So we, we want to um, have the right people on board here. Yes, we need processes. Yes, we need, you know, certain SOPs and all these kind of things. That's very important for business as you grow. However, I think it will get a little bit less um, fast or with some of those decision-making at least. But everybody is very much on board that that is the one of the key elements why bushel plus is um is growing like that and is um you know helping farmers in the way we do or successful in the growth um and everybody is aware that that's kind of needed and everybody likes that so to your question it will change a little bit but everybody wants to hold on to that because they see how bad it can get if you have to pitch an idea to corporate and you know have 60 people making a decision and by the time the decision is made it, the timing is over yeah. um so we're but there's other fortunate. advantages that come scale capital processes you know momentum big companies have a place in the world too but it's it's, it's like oh, it's, it's a crops it's constantly growing up and being harvested you know yeah yeah. Oh, I'm not knocking one or the other here. Please don't take it that way. I, I really nope. want to take the humble approach here on, on not telling other people how to run their business or how to do it. That's, that's really not me, but it's for us. We really want to keep that very much alive. Again, that, those are our brand pillars, right? The continuous innovation and technical excellence. Those are two of our brand pillars. And that's very, very important for us to, to grow the business into, uh, to grow the business with that because it's very farmer success driven here. What have you learned by hiring 30 people? <laughs> and we all know that sometimes people are fit and sometimes they're, they're not. And we as leaders, if we get that wrong, that's on us. But what, what yeah. have you learned? That's a great question. 
Um, I've definitely have learned to have an interview process that's not just one interview. <laughs> um, there has to be. <laughs> there yeah. has to be. I mean, it depends on the it depends on the job too, and yeah. and and the position. But probably having more than one interview, um, having a really good process in place, like you know, like a skill scope set, and you know, like a pre some pre questions, kind of like a written interview prior. And then once you're hired, the other portion of that is a really good onboarding program, yeah. which, you know, has been in the past where it was just a couple of people here. It was like, okay, let's go. Hello. Welcome to Bushel Plus. 